Chapter 4 Introduction to Probability In this video, we'll be focusing on the rules of probability. We'll be covering each one, including some examples to demonstrate how they work. So the first probability rule is that the probability of something happening is always going to be between 0 and 1, where 0 has no chance of happening and 1 is a 100% chance of happening. Probability rule number 2 states that when we add up all the probabilities of all possible outcomes, it should equal to 1, or 100%. So these two rules are helpful to double check to see if we've made any errors in our calculations. Let's see how probability rules 1 and 2 go together. Say a sales manager has placed a new toy on display in a Target store. The following shows the probabilities associated with the number of toys that sell in the first 30 minutes on display. So here in our table on the left, we have x representing the number of toys sold, and then p of x is the probability of that many toys being sold. So for instance, there is a 0 0.2 probability that zero toys will get sold. According to rule number one, for any event of interest, our probability of it occurring will be somewhere between 0 and 1. So you can see in each of our probabilities here, they are between 0 and 1. According to rule number 2, if we add up all our probabilities of all our possible outcomes, it should equal to 1. So we can look here, add this all up in our calculator, and it'll equal to 1, or 100%. Now let's look at rule number 3. In this rule, the probability of an event of interest is equal to the sum of the probabilities for each individual outcome forming that event of interest. In other words, we just need to add up whatever we're interested in. Let's look at the Target example. It's the same story as before with the sales manager at Target, and here we've got the probabilities for the number of products that sell in the first 30 minutes on display. If we wanted to know what the probability is that two or more products would sell, we would identify our related probabilities in the table. So we can see here we're going to be working with two and three products sold. So in other words, we can write our event of interest as parentheses two comma three. To get our total probability of our particular event of interest, we'll add the probabilities we see here. So 0 0.4 plus 0 0.1 is 0 0.5. Therefore, the probability of two or more products selling is 50%. The complement rule is related but doesn't get its own number, but you're going to see this one a lot in future chapters. The complement rule states that the probability of the complement of an event E is simply 1 minus the probability of that event. This is related to rules 1 and 2. So here we can see an example of a die that has six sides or six numbers. And so if the event that we want, like I'm in Vegas, I'm rolling my die, and I need a five or six to win, the complement of that is just everything else. So we would take one minus the event that I want. That'll give me the complement of that event. Using our same target store example, we have the probabilities shown here, and we now want to know what is the probability that one or more products will sell. According to our addition rule earlier, we can simply add up the probabilities for one or more products. So when we add up 0 0.3 plus 0 0.4 plus 0 0.1, we get 0 0.8. Now if we use the complement rule, we can find the same answer in a faster, simpler way. We would use the complement of what we're interested in. The complement of one or more is what's left. In this case, zero. So using the complement rule, we would take one minus the probability of zero toys getting sold, or 1 minus 0.2, and we get 0 0.8. So we get the same answer as before, but it's faster because we understand how complements work. Next is rule number four, which is an addition rule for any two events. Here when we talk about two events occurring, you'll see the word or, which means we add. For instance, here, this might look familiar, it's a Venn diagram where there are two areas overlapping in the middle for any events that occur jointly. We can see in our example here on the right, if we took a pack of 52 cards and we wanted to see the probability of drawing hearts or drawing kings, we will notice that there is an overlap where there is a king of hearts. 
The formula states that we'll take the probability of our first event, which is the cards with hearts, plus the probability of our second event, which is cards with kings, and then subtract the probability of getting a card that has a heart and a king. The reason why we do this little bit of subtraction at the end is that we don't want to double count the probability of our king of hearts occurring because there's only one king of hearts card in our deck. But if we don't subtract, then we're acting as if there are two kings of hearts in the deck. So that's why we subtract. Let's look at another example of the same rule. When drawing from a deck of 52 cards, we want to know what the probability of drawing a red card or an ace. The or tells us that we're going to use the addition rule because we want to add up the probabilities of getting either a red or an ace. So first we'll have to look at each probability occurring. We know there are 26 cards in a deck of cards, so there's a 26 out of 52 chance that we get a red card in that same deck. We also know that there are four aces, so we have a 4 out of 52 chance of drawing aces. Notice though that what we have identified as our probabilities for red cards and aces has an overlap. So we need to subtract 2 over 52 because we can see right here we, are, we have an overlap of our red aces and we don't want to count the red aces twice. Now you can see in my setup here we are working with fractions and so we'll add the 26 plus 4 minus 2 and since our denominator is consistent we're okay so that's 28 over 52 and when I divide the two we get 0 0.54 as the probability of getting a red card or an ace. As you can see in our chart right here what we're doing is a joint frequency table which we learned about in chapter 2. For probability rule number five, this is another addition rule, but this is specifically for mutually exclusive events, so there is no overlap. In our example, we have aces and kings, and there's no overlap between these two events. So to find the probability of pulling aces or kings, we would simply add them up together. Recall that mutually exclusive events cannot occur at the same time. Let's look at an example of rule number five. Boot World has three styles of work boots, six pairs of style A, 12 pairs of style B, and two pairs of style C. If a clerk randomly picks one pair to put on display, what's the probability that this boot will be style A or style C? The OR tells us that we're going to add up both probabilities. So here we would need to identify the probability of each boot style occurring. For style A, we've got six possible pairs and we'll divide that by 20 because there are a total of 20 pairs possible. I found that by taking six plus 12 plus two. And so the probability of getting style A is 0 0.3. And we'll do the same for style B. There's my 12 pairs divided by the 20 total. We get 0 0.6. And for style C, we get the two pairs divided by the total of 20, and that gives us 0 0.1. And to double check, you can see that when we add this all up, it equals to 1, and all of our probabilities are somewhere between 0 and 1. Now, because if one style of boot is selected, another style cannot also be selected. So imagine the little pedestal in the store only has so much room for one boot. We can see that these events are mutually exclusive. So we'll go ahead and add the probability of style A and style C. So we'll take 0.3 plus 0.1, and we get 0.4 as the probability of selecting a boot that's either style A or style C. On to probability rule six, which is the conditional probability for any two events. This rule states that the probability of one event will occur given that some other event has already happened. That's what this line right here means between two particular events. It doesn't mean divide, it means what's the probability of event one occurring given that event two has occurred. You'll notice that at the top, we've got the probability of both events occurring. So that's known as a joint probability. Joint means two variables or two events occurring together. And the denominator here is our marginal probability. So the total probability of the second event occurring. Then we'll divide 
our joint probability by our marginal probability to get our conditional probability. Now to be honest, I'm not so great with memorizing these formulas. I approach my problems more from a logic standpoint or critical thinking method. So don't worry about memorizing how these formulas are structured. Um, think about it more about how you would apply it when solving a problem. So let's look at an example. Maricosta conducted a study on the types of business stats courses students enroll in based on where they live. Below is a joint frequency table for 65 students surveyed. If a student lives in Oceanside, what's the probability that she will enroll in a hybrid course for business stats? So here's our table. On the left here is the communities our students reported living in. And over here in the columns is the type of business stats courses available to sign up for. Note that I've identified each event of interest with the numbered E, so it'll help us when we work with the conditional probability formula. You could have started the numbering anywhere. You could have done one, two, three across the top and then four, five, six on the bottom or the way I have it. It's really just a way to keep things organized. So for the two events of interest, E1 or our first event of interest is a student that lives in Oceanside. For our other event of interest is event six, which is someone that takes the business 204 hybrid version of the course. So what you'll want to do is read the joint table finding our joint probability, so where E1 meets E6. And how we would write that as a probability statement of interest is what's the probability that a student enrolls in a hybrid version given that they live in Oceanside. So to set up the formula, we've got the joint probability, and I look at my chart at E1 and E6, that's going to be the 10, so we can put a 10 up here and then for the probability of our E1. So this is our marginal probability. E1 is students that live in Oceanside. So what we want to do is add up all the students that live in Oceanside. So we'll take 7 plus 8 plus 10. And to simplify to make sure my math's correct, I'll just bring my 10 over. And when I add 7, 8, and 10, we get 25. And then I'll go ahead and divide these two numbers and so the probability that a student enrolls in a hybrid course given that they live in Oceanside is 0.4 or 40 percent. Probability rule number seven is the conditional probability for independent events. Recall that independent events do not affect each other in any way and so the conditional probability of one event occurring given that a second independent event has already occurred is simply the probability of the first event. The multiplication rule is our probability rule number eight, and it can be used whenever we want to find the probability of two events, but we do not know the joint relative frequencies. Let's look at an example. Imagine we have a small boutique hotel which has 20 rooms. Five of the rooms are suites with a living room and a bedroom, while the other 15 are traditional hotel rooms, meaning they don't have living rooms. What's the probability that the first two rooms booked during the week of October 13 through 19 are both suites if the bookings are assumed to be random. So we're going to use S to represent suite and T to represent traditional. That just makes it a little bit easier. In this case, we only care about the suites themselves and we want to find the probability that our first two rooms that are booked will be suites. So that's what we have written right here. What's the probability that the first room booked is a suite and the second room booked is a suite? So you can see here what we do with our formula is we need to first find well, what's the probability that our first room booked is a suite. Since we know that there are five suites out of the 20 possible rooms, we will take five divided by 20. And that gives us the probability of our first room being a suite. Now, because we wanna know about two rooms, we will have to multiply it by a second event. So the second event is this right here. And this might look familiar, it's a conditional probability. What's the probability that a second room is a suite given that the first room booked was also a suite? We know that the second booking is affected by the first booking because the first room which is a suite is already booked. You can't have two different guests in one room, right? So what we have to do is we're going to update our numbers. 
this is where critical thinking really comes in handy. If I know one of the 20 rooms is already booked, which happens to be a suite, that means I know that there are only four suites left and there's only 19 rooms left. So that's where my four out of 19 occurs. So when I go ahead and multiply my two fractions, five over 20 times four over 19, we get 0 0.053 or 5.3% chance of the first two rooms booked being suites. The multiplication rule for independent events is probability rule number nine. When our events are independent, we simply multiply them together. So here we have a Midwestern city with three major airlines that serve the airport. Suppose 60% of passengers fly United Airlines, 30% fly Delta, 10% fly Southwest. Further suppose that 70% of the flyers are flying for pleasure and 30% fly for business. Assuming that the type of trip and the airline used are independent of each other, what's the probability that a flyer uses United and is a business traveler? So again, here's our setup. We're interested in the probability that the flyers are United and business travelers. And so we'll multiply the probability of United, which is 0.6, by the probability of business, which is 0.3. And so the chances of getting a flyer who uses United and is a business traveler is 0 0.18 or 18%. Let's practice some of these rules of probability. So the URS Corporation Construction Company has submitted two bids, one to build a large hotel in London and one to build a commercial office in New York City. The company believes it has a 40% chance of winning the hotel bid and a 25% chance of winning the office building bid. The company also believes that winning the hotel bid is independent of winning the office building bid. So let's identify the applicable probabilities first. The chance of winning the hotel is 0.4, so I'm rewriting my percentages as decimals, and the probability of winning the office is 0.25. In part A, what is the probability URS will win both contracts? So what we're going to be using is rule number nine, multiplication rule for independent events. We know it's independent because the story said so. And we'll just go ahead and multiply the probability of winning each contract. So the probability of winning the hotel times the probability of winning the office. So taking 0 0.4 times 0 0.25 we get 0.10 or 10% chance that the company wins both contracts. In part B, what's the probability URS will win at least one contract? So here we're gonna be using rule number four, the addition rule for any two events. So here we'll take the probability of the hotel plus the probability of the office and subtract the joint occurrence of winning the hotel and the office. Essentially, we're removing the double counting of this event. So we'll take 0 0.4 plus 0 0.25. These two numbers were from up here. And we'll minus the 0 0.1, which we got in part A. So we get the probability of winning at least one contract being 0 0.55. In part C, Let's say we also want to know what's the probability that URS will lose both contracts. Since we know the probabilities of winning, we can use the complement rule to find out the chance of losing. So we're going to be using the complement rule and rule number nine. So for the complement rule, we'll take one minus the probability of winning the hotel. So the complement of that is one minus 0.4 or 0 0.6. And we also need to find the complement of winning the office bid. So we'll take one minus 0 0.25, and that gives us 0 0.75. And then we'll use rule number nine, which lets us multiply these two events to get the combined probability. So 0 0.6 times 0 0.75 gives us 0 0.45 or 45% chance of losing both contracts. So if you have any questions, just let me know.